So let's get into this discussion about Basilisk. We're actually, I think I'm just going to start it right now. We're going to jump over to my screen capture. And you'll see here we're on D&D Beyond. Uh, ignore the little Foundry stuff there that we got going on just because it's uh, there for when I port things over into Foundry. Uh, but when you look at the Basilisk here, so we got a challenge rating three creature. You normally would think, oh, okay, challenge three creature, not that big of a deal. Like, you can stick this up against a, you know, a four person group of level three is not such a big deal. But that's the place where a lot of dungeon masters actually get a little bit tripped up, especially with a creature of the Basilisk. So one of the DM tips of the week was actually to actually, you know, read through your stat blocks to make sure that you actually are not overstepping or overshooting at an encounter. And the Basilisk is actually a great example of if you don't read your stat block, you could actually TPK your party without even realizing it. So when you look through this Basilisk, nothing too crazy. I mean, we got like an armor class 15. Most of your normal level three characters are probably going to hit just because most of them are going to have at least a plus five to hit, whether it be with a spell attack or whether it be with a weapon attack or anything else like that. We've got 52 hit points, which is actually a pretty good chunky amount of hit points here considering a challenge rating three creature. So something to keep in mind as you're kind of going through it. Negative one initiative, not a big deal. 20 speed, actually pretty slow, which is kind of helpful. But there's a lot of things that you can you can already see in this giant wall of text here, what I'm getting at here if you've read ahead. But we've got dark vision, we got a passive perception, we got no languages, so it doesn't speak any languages other than creature, I guess. Um, and then like we said, challenge rating three, we got a high strength, low dex, high con, makes a lot of sense for these hardy creatures. Basilisks are known for also living in a lot more um, rugged environments like underground, even hot environments like um, in arid areas and deserts and stuff like that. Uh, stuff along those lines so they're gonna have a pretty good constitution but otherwise they're normal kind of like because they're a creature their kind of mental stats are gonna be pretty average or pretty low I say average for a monster or a creature but um, pretty low generally speaking when we talk about going against our player characters but that's not really what we're worried about with them what we're worried about with them is this petrifying gaze so this particular I would call it an ability is the best way I can put it it's not an active ability necessarily. Um, I mean, it is, but it isn't, I guess is the best way to put it. So if a creature starts its turn within 30 feet of the Basilisk and the two of them can see each other, the Basilisk can force the other creature to make a DC 12 constitution saving throw. And if they fail, provided the Basilisk isn't incapacitated, which is, you know, very specific circumstances. On a failed save, that creature is gonna be magically turned to stone and they're gonna become restrained. So the restrained condition, as you can see here, their speed becomes zero, can't benefit any bonus of their speeds, attack rolls against the creature have an advantage. Creatures attack rolls at disadvantage. Creature has disadvantage on dexterity saving throws. It then must repeat the saving throw at the end of its turn. So a little bit different than the Medusa, um, which has different kind of um, different levels of failure, basically. Um, and it must repeat the saving throw at the end of, it, of its next turn. If they succeed, the effect ends. They can move as normal. On a failure, the pet, their creature is now petrified, and it cannot be healed until freed by the Greater Restoration spell or any other kind of magics. A creature that isn't surprised, which... You know, if you start a combat encounter and you know that this Basilisk is around, you're not going to be surprised. You can avert your eyes, and, you, and if you do so, you can't see the Basilisk until the end of your next turn, which you can then avert your eyes again. If it looks at the Basilisk in the meantime, it must immediately make the save. If the Basilisk sees its own... This is actually some really fun flavor text as a DM to make sure you understand this as well. If you are playing your Basilisk and they see their own reflection within 30 feet of it in bright light, it will mistake itself for a rival and will target itself with its gaze, possibly causing itself to freeze. Or petrify. So, the reason why this can be very dangerous for low level parties is because if they fail your save on this petrifying gaze, they are all restrained. If they fail again, which is very possible if you have a, a party of a lot of wizards or just parties with just generally low constitution. I mean, a 12 DC check, if you don't have a con of two, I mean, even if you do have a con of plus two, it's a coin flip. This is a coin flip save or die mechanic. Uh, which is not necessarily going to be the most fun thing in the world. So keep that in mind before you throw this against your players. Like this is literally a save or die monster to an extent, similar to your um, uh, what's it called? Your um, uh, it's not mind flare. I, I can't remember off the top of my head right now. But um, there's other creatures that are very similar to this, where they have these abilities that are kind of save or die. Uh, luckily, with this petrifying gaze with the basilisk, you get the second chance, uh, which I actually really like. I like the fact that it allows you to have this kind of two staged kind of thing. Uh, Medusa is very similar, and we'll cover that in another video sometime in the future, but it allows that extra kind of stage. So it's not necessarily a save or die, it's a save or save or die. So you get a chance to kind of re-save again. 
Now, like I said, there's still a pretty good possibility that you're going to fail that save again. So if, even if you're a plus two to your to your constitution, you're getting a coin flip. Coin flip is a coin flip. There's still a chance that you're going to fail both those saving throws, and it's pretty high. So that's something to keep in mind as you kind of think about this for your party. Like, you could literally have your entire party be incapacitated on round one. Yeah, it can happen. And then the rest of them turn to stone, and... At this low of a level, yeah, like, yeah, Greater Restoration can revive them. But at this low of a level, none of your characters, especially if they're all, like, level 3s and level 4s, they're not going to have Greater Restoration Magic available to them at this stage of their adventure. So, things to keep in mind. In addition to its Petrifying Gaze, it's got its Bite Attack. It's a single attack, single target attack, reach 5 feet. 2d6 plus 3 piercing damage for an average of 10. Plus 2d6 for an average of 7. So, it's putting out 17 points of damage with just one Bite Attack. Uh, it's not the, it's, it's okay, like, it's not the biggest kind of humongous bang for your buck kind of attack, but on the same flip side, like, it's one attack, so it's, it's doing a good amount, um, but it's not getting that multi-attack, which a lot of creatures start getting at challenge level three, so not a huge deal here with that, but the big thing, obviously, that balances out is this big petrifying gaze. So like we said, the Basilisk is much more of a, um, lives in a much arid climate, underground, all that kind of stuff. The reason why they actually have this Petrifying Gaze is because they actually utilize it to then turn their prey into stone, so that way they can then eat. That's what it's for. So there is actually, um, the way they actually describe this in the lore is that there's actually some kind of gland kind of in the gullet of the Basilisk that allows it to then return that change turn creature from stone back into uh, into regular flesh again, uh, but at that point, because they've already bitten down really hard with this bite, that gland that kind of creates it to kind of change back, it's, it's just so that way it can digest its prey. That's really all it is, which is really cool, honestly. I love the flavor text behind this basilisk, but like I said, be careful when you throw this at your party. You have to know what you're doing and what you're getting yourself into. You can't just pick this this particular creature out of the player's, or out of the player's handbook, out of the monster manual, and just assume that everything's gonna be fine for your group of level three adventurers as a four group, four person group. It's not necessarily gonna be okay. Like, there's a chance that you could wipe your entire party with this one creature just because of its petrifying gaze. So, I hope that was helpful for you guys. Like I said, a lot of really cool flavor text here. Um, you can also, there's actually, um, some alchemists actually take the, uh, the fluids of that gland and basically turn it into a, uh, a nice alchemical remedy for this petrification because of the same process that it has when it's in its gullet. You can use the gland to then unpetrify somebody. So another way you can kind of RP that out. But like I said, hope that was helpful for you guys. If you guys have any questions about the Basilisk, make sure you throw questions down in the quest board if you're here on Twitch. If you're watching this later on YouTube, come down to the Twitch stream, but also throw some questions down in the comment section. Uh, if you haven't subscribed yet here on YouTube or on the YouTube channel, or if you haven't subscribed or followed on the Twitch channel, I would really appreciate it. It helps me out a lot. And like I said, hope you guys learned something. Until next time, happy gaming.